So the first question is, how long till Google takes over our minds? <laughs> Maybe they've already taken over our minds. But seriously, there's no easy way for Google or any other part of the internet to take over our minds in that way, because that would involve somehow systematically interfering with our minds and controlling. And I think even the most paranoid people can't see a way of doing that. But it's an interesting question about whether social networks are changing our brain or whether parts of our brain that are involved in all sorts of social relationships um, are also involved in social networks like online social networks. We've done some research and there's been some other um, early bits of research showing that, for example, how many friends you have on social networks like Facebook um, can be associated with changes in the structure of particular parts of your brain. And these particular parts of the brain are particularly interested um, in social interaction with other people. So we don't know from that evidence uh, whether the internet is changing your brain, that is, uh, if you have more friends on Facebook, your brain changes, or whether it's the other way around. Um, if you're a particularly friendly person and your brain is, is wired that way, you end up having more friends on Facebook. So we don't know uh, whether that correlation implies causation in one or the other direction, but research is ongoing in that area. Fantastic. Thank you. It's really interesting to see differences in genes that are implicated in human speech production and what their effects are in an animal model. Um, but it's important also to be careful um, about extrapolating from animal models to humans. So it's uh, not rocket science. Uh, rats and mice and other animals like that are not the same as humans. Uh, they run around and, and live in different places and they don't build universities and social networks and the internet and do neuroscience. However, the basic structure of how mammalian brains operate and the basic underlying molecular biology is the same. So by understanding some of the uh, pathways that certain genes, uh, when expressed, are active in and how those change, it might be possible uh, to extrapolate from animals to humans. But bear in mind, uh, that's a long-term uh, goal because... Again, one has to understand not only what's actually happening in those animal models, but also how they relate all the way up the scale to humans. So this question is about the assumptions that we make about our data when we're doing fMRI analysis. So whenever neuroscientists analyse any data, uh, they make certain assumptions when they employ statistical tests as to whether the data are normally distributed or not. And that's true, of course, in functional MRI data. They're no different to, really conceptually, to any other kind of data that one would use in psychology. But what's important is some of the assumptions we use when we use parametric statistics are underpinned uh, by empirical evidence and by theoretical work on something called uh, Gaussian uh, rand field theory, which need not detain us here. Um, and those have been shown over quite, quite a long period of time and in many different laboratories to be perfectly reasonable assumptions. Of course, it's important to always question those assumptions, and the use of non-parametric methods has also uh, come about in recent years. There are also extensions of how we analyse fMRI data. Some people have heard of pattern recognition techniques and multivariate approaches, and each of those come with their own set of statistical assumptions. The field of statistics, um, as applied to functional neuroimaging data, is now really quite mature. It's been going for 20 or 30 years internationally. And so there's now a well-developed body of methodological knowledge about how to analyze fMRI data.